This is Future Builders Podcast, and I'm your host, Teemu Uotila. I'm an enthusiastic future explorer working with a Finnish tech company. Together with my guests, we are building the future today. Are you in? This is Future Builders Podcast with Oswald Damodarn, professor of finance at NYU Stern School of Business. He's the author of Dark Side of Valuation and an awarded teacher, fascinated by finance and markets. Together with him, we'll be finding out what should cryptocurrencies do in order to succeed, why 24-7 trading isn't necessarily a good thing, is the trend of corporate social responsibility mostly PR? In this episode with Aswat, we'll look into the future. So if you look, uh, for instance, in in, in future, these uh, cryptocurrencies, we touched a little bit about them in our, you know, everyday lives, but they are still very vague as a, as a, you know, concept and people don't trust them, which is actually very, very true because you read more about cryptocurrency frauds than you re- read about people robbing banks. Right. So uh, how do you perceive them since they are no, not linked to gold or anything tangible assets like that? I'll tell you the biggest problem with cryptocurrencies is that are the promoters because uh, the people who promote cryptocurrencies are a crazy group. Are they're, For the most part, they're They're a bit. Peer- I mean, in a sense, it reflects the history of cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin actually was born out of a paper written by Satoshi Nakamoto in October of 2008. Remember that October of 2008 was a month into the worst financial crisis the world has had probably in the last century since the Great Depression. It was a time when we trusted nobody and and no entity. Governments were not trustworthy. Banks were not trustworthy. Investments were not trustworthy. Everybody had lost trust. It was born in a moment of paranoia, and its design reflects that paranoia. If you look at the cryptocurrencies, what they share in common is we don't trust central banks. We don't trust governments. We're going to build a currency where you don't have to trust anyone. And the way they did it is by creating this really inefficient way of checking a transaction of mining and you know, where where effectively when I buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks and I used Bitcoin, which I can't do right now, but let's say I did, a thousand Ukrainian miners have to work three hours on a computer to tell me that the transaction works. But it reflects the fact that you can't trust banks and you can, you really are creating. So the problem with cryptocurrencies as designed now is they're born out of so much paranoia and so little trust that they're completely inefficient currencies. Doesn't have to be that way. You could create a cryptocurrency that is much more efficient because I think there is a there, there is really a role for digital currencies in the world we're in. We already live in a digital world. I hardly ever take cash out of my pocket anymore, right? Everything is on Apple Pay, it's on my phone. And, and so we already do it. So having a digital currency is just one step forward. But for that digital currency to be an efficient currency, we have to trust someone. And that's something that the people who have created the Bitcoins and the Ethereums are not willing to accept. They don't want to trust anyone. So they've created a currency that will work perhaps for, you know, for a very, very small segment of the population, maybe for Venezuelans who don't trust their government even less than they trust, you know, the Ukrainian miners. Yeah. But I think these the, the cryptocurrencies have to let go of the opacity that they built into the system because that's not that's not a good feature for a currency. Yeah, so so it sort of lacks this stability that people would would trust them. And it, and it, but it's a, it's by design, right? Because yeah. because you listen to anybody talk about why Bitcoin is good, notice how much of the time they talk about why Bitcoin is good by telling you how much money you could have made on Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. Right? I but, mean, that's not a currency feature. I'm not saying it's a Swiss franc a good currency, and then I don't look at how much money could I've made speculating on the Swiss franc over the last 10 years. The essence of a good currency is you want it to be stable. But the problem is the people who are making money on cryptocurrencies now don't want them to be stable because the way they make money is by wild movements in the price. So that's why I said we've got to get these people out of the room if we want to design a currency, a cryptocurrency that actually works. Yeah. 
It, it was. Uh, I, I remember. I, I don't. I haven't done any yet, but I, I watched closely when when one of my good colleagues was actually. Well, he invested like a couple of hundred euros on that there. But uh, when it was trading, let, I think it was above twenty uh, thousand mm. dollars or something like that. What what struck very odd to me is that if the you know price is increasing and if the demand is such high, then why it took him three days to sell the assets that he had. Exactly. That's very odd in my mind. <laughs> it's not liquid. It's it's very opaque, and you're not even sure who you're selling it to, right? That's a feature of the crypto exchanges, is you can't exactly... I mean, if I, if I wanted to see the trading on a particular stock or a bond, I can go look at the books to see what the buying and the selling look like. Bitcoin, I have no idea where the trading is happening. And sometimes when you see the price take off, you're not sure whether the price is taking off because somebody is manipulating markets. It might be unfair to make that judgment, but as long as markets are opaque, I have to be suspicious about what's causing these big price movements. Yeah, definitely. How do you see governments to roll in there? Do you see them being a player at some point and, and moving totally towards that? Or do you see that this will be totally a private uh, private thing. Well, the problem is you can't have currencies be private because how will governments collect taxes yeah. and monitor transactions? It's impossible. And that's the other thing that I try to bring to cryptocurrency users is you can't make the government your enemy. If every government is your enemy, you will not survive as a currency. There is no way. So I think that the cryptocurrency that will eventually succeed will be one that has the tacit acceptance of most governments in the world. Not all governments, but most governments. Where the gov- And to do that, the cryptocurrency has to accept transparency because yeah. governments want to know when you're buying and selling stuff because otherwise they can't track stuff. Yeah. So that's why I said the paranoia that the inventors of Bitcoin brought to the game have essentially shackled Bitcoin to make it more difficult for it to become an acceptable currency because no Bitcoin um, fanatic is ever going to accept governments monitoring their transactions that to them will be the death knell so it's almost by design these cryptocurrencies are designed to fail yeah how do you see them by the way do you see that you should tie them to some you know materia for instance gold or or something like that is that an important factor well if you tie it in then i have to be able to monitor it right yeah so that's the problem is It, there are sensible ways of building a cryptocurrency where you can tie it into either a physical asset or a established currency. But for me to trust that it's tied in, I have to be able to observe that you actually have the stuff to back it up. There actually have been cryptocurrencies that claim to be tied to the U.S. dollar. But the only problem is the people who built the currency won't let you check their U.S. dollar holdings to see if they are in fact backing their word. They just said, trust us. It's backed by a dollar. How do I know if I if I can't see that you hold the dollars to back it up? So in the old gold in the, the old gold standard, central banks actually showed the gold that they had in their reserves to yeah. back up their currency. And so unless you show it to me, I can't I can't take you at your word. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. You you could also go to Fort Knox and see that there's actual gold in there. And, exactly. <laughs> very well, and we're not in a gold standard anymore. Yeah, so it's yeah. not even that the government is claiming it. But in the old days, you did have to show the gold to back up your currency. Yeah, I think it was, when was it? It was back in the 70s or a bit earlier than that? When 70, 71 was when we went off the gold yeah, standard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you look at this, then trading in the future, uh, There's a lot of trends that this 24-7 kind of trading system is, is coming. Do you perceive that as a good or a bad thing? It's, all, it's already there, and I think it's bad, because I think it's, for, it's bad for investors, and here's why. History shows us, and studies back this up, that the more activity you have as an investor, the worse off you become, for two reasons. One is, when you trade 24-7, you're often trading for emotional reasons, not intellectual reasons. You're trading because you woke up at midnight on Saturday night, you checked your stock, it had dropped 18% during the day, you panicked and you sold. At midnight, you're not even thinking straight. Yeah. So the first thing that happens is you trade on emotions and historically trading on emotions. The second thing is when you trade, there's a transactions cost. It might be small, but if you keep trading every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes, it starts adding up. So historically, the more active investors have been, the worse their returns have been. 
And in many ways, I think that's been augmented by the fact that we also have constant access to information. I mean, I tell people 40 years ago, if you were a doctor and you'd put your money into a portfolio, you didn't even know what was happening to your portfolio during the course of a day. Or if you're an engineer or if you're any kind of worker other than in the investment business, you had no idea what your portfolio was doing between nine and five, maybe at six o'clock when you got home. And even then, I don't see how you could have checked. You probably had to wait till the next day, open up the paper, check the stock pages to see whether your stock went up or down during the course of the day, right? Yeah. Today, on your phone, you're checking your portfolio every minute of every day. And you can trade any minute of every day. We've opened ourselves up to emotional reactions to, and I think that's one reason markets have become more volatile, is investors feed on each other's fears and emotions in both directions. Yeah. So I think that it's not a good thing for investors, but it's uh, from a liquidity perspective, I think it's good because it means you can get out of a stock any time of any day, but there are going to be, there's going to be a side cost of higher volatility and some investors not knowing their limits and losing a lot of money. Yeah, that's a problem with with the technology and stuff like that is that it's definitely driving people work in a 24-7 rhythm. Uh, exactly. You always need to be available. So the faster yeah. pace will create more stress. And when you're stressed, you might not necessarily do the right t- decisions like like you said. So it's a it's a very good point. Uh, if you look, for instance, what, what Larry Fink said, the uh, CEO of BlackRock, he predicted that within the next few years, uh, investors will measure, measure also company impact on based on society, governmental and envi- environmental issues. Do you also I, I see think, similar? Yeah, yeah. I think Larry Fink's, uh, Fink is the biggest hypocrite on the face of the earth. <laughs> I mean, I mean, and he has to say all the right things because BlackRock is the biggest passive investment vehicle in the world, right? BlackRock yeah. and Vanguard essentially drive the world. Yeah, they have like right three trillion in, in exactly, assets or something exactly. like that. I yeah. mean, I tell black, I tell people, I go to you know, parts of the world, remote parts of the world. I I could be in um, in Indonesia looking up. You know, Indonesia is not exactly remote, but in a, in a small emerging market, look up the ten largest companies, and look at who who owns the most shares in these companies. BlackRock is there. Yeah. So BlackRock is a shareholder, not just in large developed market companies, but large emerging emerging market companies. It's a passive vehicle. Now, Larry Fink obviously has a lot of weight to throw around, but I think ultimately he has a constituency, which is people who put their money with BlackRock don't expect, uh, are not getting payoffs in social dividends, they're getting in cash dividends. So as long as you can deliver good stuff for society without hurting the bottom line, Larry Fink is going to be okay. So maybe you should add that constraint to his statement, which is going forward, companies be judged on their societal effects and their environmental effects. But ultimately, if you want companies to be socially responsible, and I firmly believe this, you've got to make it in their economic best interest to be socially responsible, which means we all have to put money where our mouth is. Yeah. You care about the environment, stop buying that SUV. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's you definitely. care about you know, child labor, don't go to Walmart and look for the cheapest way to get something you need. Here's what I think. I think people like companies to be socially responsible, but as long as it doesn't create inconvenience for them as in, as individual consumers and as investors. And that's a hypocrisy that I think is magnified when you have somebody like Larry Fink get up there on a platform and spout off about corporate governance or, you know, societal responsibility. I don't for a moment believe the guy. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely that people have this strategy of commons way of thinking. If it's, you know, so far away, it doesn't really concern you. So if you would see the, you know, clothes being made by a young, young kid, I don't think you would actually buy them. But as you don't see it, then yeah, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Uh, how do you see then in in your own perspective that do these soft values? Uh, do companies need to actually prove that they are they are behind those? And does it actually increase the investor value in in your eyes? Can I give you my cynical view about corporate social? Of course, <laughs> of it's course. Big, it's a big, it has become the biggest scam game on the face of the earth. There are people making lots of money off this, off this 
supposedly new trend, right? You got people advising companies in corporate social responsibility. Where within companies, you have corporate social responsibility. People whose job it is to make sure it gets delivered. You have people who write portions of annual reports to convince the world that you're socially responsible. Let me ask you a question. After so, we now teach corporate social responsibility in business schools as a full course. So 30 years into this game, are companies more socially responsible now than they were 30 years ago just with all of these trends? And my answer is no. So I am convinced that a lot of this is PR. Much of it is, you know, let's make let's give ourselves this protection because I, I firmly believe that corporate social responsibility is something that you have to build in as a constraint. I tell people, go. You can't go out and say, my job as a company is to maximize societal benefits because you won't survive as a company. Your job is to still go out and maximize earnings, cash flows, and value subject to the constraint of being a good social citizen, which means that There are some lines which you might be able to cross legally, but you will choose not to cross because you will feel that crossing that line makes it. But I think it's a constraint. And it's a constraint that governments have to help draw a line on by saying, if you cross that line, there are consequences, there are costs. Because we let this play out in the free market, good companies are going to be hurt at the expense of bad companies. And the reason is bad companies will not have those constraints. They will do whatever they wanted. And we live in a global environment where you as a country can put in those good citizen constraints into your laws. So let's say all the Scandinavian countries put in good citizen constraints into their laws. And then these companies have to go compete in the rest of the world against Indonesian companies or Indian companies or Chinese companies without these constraints. We're just de-weaponizing our own companies, and we're going to let them lose. And those Chinese and Indian companies are eventually going to take over yeah. the Scandinavian market. So I think it's a tricky game. It's not just feel-good policies. You can't just legalize this process and say, let's just let's pass laws making companies into good citizens. It's, it's a slow process that requires work that none of the existing CSR literature or people is even dealing with. Ultimately, you got to think about ways in which you can bring corporate social responsibility into the financials of a company and, and to make companies feel that by being socially responsible, they're actually doing the best job they can for their stockholders. Yeah. You, can't, you can't make this a separate objective. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That this should be some sort of aligned with making the profits and creating value of the organization. That actually reminded me of uh, what what Ricardo Semler said a few years back. That uh, when when they asked him about the the charity thing, he said that if you if you give give money back to the charity, you have taken too much from the system, <laughs> and yeah. you you do it because of guilt. <laughs> well, uh, and I th- and I say here's the other way I frame it when. Corporate corporations provide charity, they're taking that power away from their shareholders because ultimately, there's a statement they're making there, right? Which is, if we gave this money back to the shareholders and they gave to their charities, those charities are somehow less prestigious, less good than the charities we pick. Because here's what my other cynical side sees when I see companies do charity. The charities are whatever the CEO thinks is a great charity. So they give yep. to the Met. If they gave that, so if I'm a stockholder in that company and they gave the money to me, not a single cent is going to go to the Met. I don't. I um, that's not where I think my charity should go. I would rather that I feed the homeless or send it to um, you know to look after children in, in you know orphan children in India. I mean, each of us has our own view of what needs to be filled. And when companies take on that role, they're taking on a role that should be left to their investors. And that that scares me because then you get corporate charities. And corporate charities are almost all big institutional charities. Yeah. Which really are like run like corporations themselves. They have CEOs who make millions of dollars. They waste money like crazy. So I'm not sure it's the best way in which we can help society. So if, I, if we want to help society, maybe we should stop companies going out there and trying to do this stuff on their own and turn it over. I mean, we've turned to crowds on everything else, right? We trust the crowd. If I want to pick a restaurant, I don't look up restaurant reviews. I look up Yelp. Yeah. If I want to go to a movie, I don't look at movie reviews. I look at Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. We've 
So why would charities, would we want CEOs of big companies making that decision for us when we as individuals can make the decisions ourselves? Yeah. The, the, one thing about looking always this maturity opinion is it's, well, people are usually usually also stupid. So, you know, that... that uh, well, I mean, at least they're stupid in small doses. Yeah. The CEO is <laughs> yeah. stupid in stupid in big doses. Yeah, big so doses. I, I think, yeah, because they're people too, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, regarding uh, the ownership in in the, in the future, do you see it's going to be more distributed among people or more centralized with with few individuals? I'll tell you, one of the uh, our economy has changed from over the last thirty or forty years from being a smokestack to more of a less capital intensive, more technology intensive world. And one of the side effects of that, and this is not just a political statement, is going to be increasing inequality of income. The best among us, the brightest among us, the most be- the most educated among us, the best trained among us, is going to make far more than the people at the lowest end of the scale. And especially if you bring automation into the game, it gets even worse because the jobs that are going to be automated the soonest are the ones that are going to take jobs away from the cashier at a Walmart or um, the person who serves you at a restaurant. And so that's going to be a given. The question is, what do we do about all these people now who are at the bottom of the scale, who are making so much, so much less than the people at the top end of the scale? So rather than getting more democratic, I think ownership is going to get less democratic. And that's going to create a political backlash. And you're starting to see this already around the world, which is the people who are in the bottom, not 20 percent, but the bottom 90 percent are saying, hey, you guys in the top 10 percent, the top 5 percent seem to be getting richer and richer. We're struggling more and more. We want a fair share. So that's where things like a basic universal income, we have to figure out ways in which money from that top 10% can be channeled to the bottom 90% without destroying every incentive system known to man. So it's going to be the struggle of the next 20 years is how we take care of this inequality. It can't be the old increase the tax rate on the wealthiest because, again, we live in a global economy. You increase tax rates individually as a country, the wealthiest among you in that country will leave and move to some place in cyberspace where there's no taxes. Yeah. So the old mechanism of let's just use 90% tax rates to kind of equalize this is not going to work. So I I don't know the answer. If I did, I'd run for office. But I think <laughs> that's, that's yeah. going to be the struggle is who's going to be able to come up with a way of of keeping that that bottom 90%, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people, kind of, few billion people. Off, <laughs> yeah. It's most of us, right? Yeah. So it's not the like the, oh, see, the, the challenge 50 years ago was much simpler, which is 80% of us are middle class or at least in the developed world. All we have to do is find a way to help the bottom 20% and we're going to be okay. Our challenge for the next 20 years is going to be very, very you know, different and much more, you know, much more of a challenge than it used to be 50 years ago. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it was a World Economic Forum study or something that when I read that uh, actually the poverty has been decreasing and life expectancy has right. been growing. So I think we have done something right, but it's absolutely going to be there. And it's a good and, question and, what and to I do. Think, yeah. it, that's interesting. You know why it is globally that's happened, right? Because China and India have in a sense, I mean, until 1980, if you looked at the previous 2,000 years, 2,000 years of Indian economic history, not much happened. Yeah. Same thing with China. It was hundreds and hundreds of years of stagnation. And if you look at the numbers, that's one third of the world's population right there. So in the last 30 years, you've seen significant economic growth, especially in China, but also in India. You've raised hundreds of millions of people That alone explains why fewer people live in poverty, is Asia has grown. But that growth has come at a cost, right? It's come from manufacturing, leaving the U.S. and Europe, going to Asia, which has created whole consequences politically yeah. for Europe and U.S. So nothing is costless. We've created a more a world with less less pure poverty and less hunger, but we've also created a world where... You've created huge pockets of people who've been left behind, 
who feel that the system is not fair to them. Regarding that, uh, if you look at future, which one do you see being a bigger risk? The, the U.S. economy with their huge loans or China's economy with their shadow bank- banking system and stuff like that happening? Well, here's the difference between the two systems. The U.S., the loans are out there. Everybody can see them. It's transparent. China, we have no idea what's under the system. It's the most opaque global economy ever built. Yeah. I mean, it's an economy where the, you're the... the Beijing will let you know what they want you to know, and they will let you know what, and they will hold back what they don't want you to know. Yeah. So my fear is always going to be China, but simply because the unknown there vastly exceeds the known. How do you see that happening? Is that is that the system would sort of like implode, implode and only affect in China or explode and cover everything? See, when when things are good, people don't notice weaknesses in systems. And for the last 20 years, the Chinese economy has been on a ride, right? 10% yeah. percent growth every year. That's that's over now. It's not a temporary slowdown simply because when you're the second largest economy in the world, you can no longer grow 10% percent a year. Yeah. So they're growing five to six percent, and those are the official numbers. I wouldn't be surprised if the actual numbers were lower. If that growth drops to two or three percent a year, the weaknesses in the system are going to show up because when things are good, you can keep paying loans that you couldn't really afford simply because growth takes care of things. But it's going to be So the the real test of the Chinese system is going to be when it actually enters a recession, which it is going to sooner or later. Yeah. When that happens, you're going to see the weaknesses in the system come to the surface. And the scary thing is it's not e- just economic unrest that I'm worried about. It's political unrest. Because the reason the Chinese political system has worked is because you've had so much economic growth covering up weaknesses. So as a government, you've been able to move tens of millions of people from one part of the country to another, do things you could not have done otherwise simply because the rest of the population said, you know, we're doing well, we don't want to risk it, let's keep the system going. So I think the real trouble in China is not just that there's a loan problem, but that there's a political problem also onto the surface. And if that comes to the surface as well, then we have some real issues. Yeah, definitely. That sounds very solid. You actually talked a little about touch this subject, uh, the universal basic income. So, yep. which one do you see being better in in, in future societies, uh, easing on taxation or creating this um, some sort of universal basic income system? Well, in a sense, you got need money for the universal basic income. So, my guess is the two will be twinned, right? Yep. You're going to have higher taxes paying for the universal base income. The problem is if the higher tax base is mobile. You might end up with only one half of the equation. Yeah, which that doesn't is, end good. <laughs> you're off, and uh, and then and and if you bring in immigration, I mean, th- there are a whole host of issues that people haven't thought through. Which is, if you're the only country with universal basic in- basic income, and you try this out, your wealthiest people flee to other countries, so they collect the tax. Those countries collect the taxes. The citizens of those other countries now move, try to move to your country to collect your universal base income. You end up being the. I mean, and, and Northern Europe has had, you know, has had an experience with this with yeah. this issue because of their because of their welfare systems and their their social safety net, which is as long as you know you didn't have huge numbers of people crossing borders, you could sustain a Swedish welfare system, you know, or a Norwegian welfare system, but. You know, in a world of mobility that we live in today, it's it's really tough to be the. So, if you're going to have a universal basic income, it's got to be almost, you know, there's got to be some consensus agreement across countries. Yeah, and it's you know, talk about getting <laughs> consensus within a country, getting consensus across countries. I yeah. can't even imagine what that'll require. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you look at the, it, would require some sort of UN level decision, and decisions don't no, happen you, there. It require <laughs> the equivalent of the EU, a global, uh, and uh, you know, given how much friction the EU itself has faced, I can't even imagine how that global yeah. agreement is going to be structured. Yeah, definitely going to be a tricky, tricky matter if you touch it. <laughs> uh, regarding the. What kind of capitalist mechanism you would like to change in order for seeing a better tomorrow for either the investor, companies, employees, or customers? Is there anything that you would like to change in, in the current situation? 
Well, I think markets are incredibly flexible mechanisms. I wouldn't change the mechanism because it, which is the only capitalist system, right? It's it's markets determine where you invest, where. And I know, uh, I know markets come with all kinds of weaknesses. I've seen them all play out. They're sometimes short term. They're sometimes irrational. They do crazy things. But remember, we don't live in a world where there is a perfect alternative. The question is, do I trust markets more or governments more? And the answer from experience, again, is I, I find that governments, when they make mistakes, yeah. not only make bigger mistakes, but I hate to admit that they're wrong. Yeah. Markets have no egos. I've always made that my biggest selling point for markets. It's not that markets are not wrong, but markets are wrong. They admit to it overnight. In a sense, the stock price can drop 85% in 15 minutes. Markets have no egos. Whereas any system built around experts, elitist governments, there are egos involved. When there are egos involved, people hate to admit mistakes. I mean, look at how countries get into wars. They're unable to extricate themselves because nobody wants to say, we screwed up. We should not have done that. Yeah. So I think about the economic analog to that, where you have experts telling you where to invest, where not to invest, what to do and what not to do. When they screw up, they will not admit they're wrong. They will keep making you do something that you should not be doing because admitting otherwise would mean that they're wrong. Yeah, definitely. And that, that's that's a very good point. Uh, governments don't ever admit that they're actually doing something wrong. They always forget any, things. <laughs> any expert elitist group doesn't, partly because it's not in their DNA. Yeah. But if you imagine how you end up becoming an expert. You were the smartest kid in high school. Then you went to the best college. You got the best grades. You got into the best places. You always been treated as a winner. Yeah. And for you to say you're wrong is just goes counter to everything you've spent your entire life building. Yeah, and pe- people are fallible, so that's everyone's good yeah, to exactly. remind that. So <laughs> no one, no one is perfect, and uh... especially when it comes to the future, right? Because in a sense, we live in this dynamic environment where the reality is, if in an honest moment, we should all admit to ourselves that we're incapable of forecasting the future, that we're going to be wrong, and we have to be willing to say upfront when we're wrong. Here are the ways we're going to respond to being wrong, rather than say, "Hey, we know we're right." And we don't even need escape hatches because we know we're right. And that's, I think, what we need to build in is a, you know, more dynamic systems which respond to what's happening around them rather than systems where you lock yourself into a policy because you know, doing something else might seem like weakness. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, for instance, what uh, Nicholas Taleb touched in his book, this anti-fragile, in that yeah. you design systems in a way that they can sustain this kind of uh, uh, exactly. instability. Yeah. If you look at the, the future future companies and how to reach great valuation, what would be your you know last three most important things or advice that companies need to need to take I, into consideration? I would give them the same advice I gave policymakers. Be willing to be wrong. Be dynamic when you're wrong that you can adapt and adjust quickly. I mean, I call this optionality, which is basically what you want to do is be ready for opportunities where you can jump in and take advantage of the opportunities quickly and be ready when you're wrong to cut your losses quickly. Because if you can do that, you've effectively brought in the best aspects of risk into your decision making. You get the upside that risk delivers and you limit your downside when you're wrong. And I think companies that are built around that theme of being dynamic and looking for opportunities were also making sure they cut their losses early when they make a mistake are going to be the ones that succeed in this new economy. Yeah, it's definitely a good thing to everyone to remember. So yeah, I think we can wrap this up now. Thank, thanks greatly for for being here, Aswat. And can you let people know where they can learn more about you and hear more about your thoughts? Well, I and I try to be as transparent as I can. So go go to Google search and you type my last name. I pretty much pop up as the first twenty search findings. But my website is just my last name dot com. Yeah, that's pretty much where I post all my data, my spreadsheets, my classes pretty much my entire life. I also have a Google blog called Musings on Markets, uh, which you can find again with Google search, just type in Musings on Markets and put in my name and it should pop up. 
I write. I don't write frequently. I write about twice, you no, know, three or four posts every every month. But hopefully, the the posts are really long. So I warn you ahead of time that these are not punchy posts. There's no news in them. They're really my perspectives, my experiences, my valuations. But um, those are the places where pretty much everything I do show up. And if you're in a bookstore, you actually buy physical books still. You you can check out my book on narrative and numbers about connecting storytelling to numbers because I think that's a skill set that you will need for the future, that the pure number crunches are going to be very quickly outsourced by machines. Yeah. And the pure storytellers are going to get swept aside by reality. So if you can connect the two, you've got a skill worth having. But that's, uh, you know, so I, I look forward to you. And if you want to, you know, reach out to me, my email address is on my website. I might not answer it right away, but I try to be pretty responsive. Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good thing. And uh, it's good that you write write this, you know, extensive analysis and, and past blog posts because, you know, in, in current uh, society that we live in, I, I definitely... I'm annoyed that everything is sort of like this sound bites that you get that you don't ever go deeper in in one subject and people you know jump to conclusions quite faster and don't know the whole story behind it. So it's definitely a good thing that <laughs> some people. I do have a Twitter by- account too, but I do, I would never could try to compress my thoughts into 140 characters or, 250 <laughs> yeah. or whatever Twitter allows right now. Yeah, you know, that that would uh, that would not do justice. Yeah, that definitely would. Ideas. Excellent. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks for your time, and uh, great to have you here. Hopefully, we can we can have a future session at at some point also. Sounds good. You just listened to Future Builders podcast with Aswat Damodaran talking about tomorrow. Listen to the previous episode where we talk about the present. The future is here tomorrow. Join the discussion on our LinkedIn page. We are Future Builders. And listen to more Future Builders podcast on wearefuturebuilders.com.